So it's always nice to take a little time and uh, sense the community that we're part of, especially at this time where many of us are more isolated than usual, of course. And especially with Dharma practice, you know, where so much, especially this course we're doing this spring on mindfulness of feeling tone, so much of the practice, practices from the Buddha, they're really against the stream. So it's already, it can be at least an isolating thing to be interested in working with the heart and the ways that we work and train the heart. So it's nice to have a sense, not just the people we're with, but even a, a deeper sense of all the people before us and probably all the people after us who find these teachings really practical and life-changing. And uh, one way to do it is just to realize that, oh, look at this, 126 people or so are coming together when we're probably already having too many Zoom hours, you know, coming together to spend a Monday evening for seven weeks to be reflecting on these teachings. And so I'm gonna paste now in the uh, chat for those who are brand new to the Buddhist studies program, a big welcome. I was sort of looking back through my notes and I think the first time we did the mindfulness of feeling tone was in 1990. And I believe we started the, uh, the Buddhist studies either in 1999 or 1998. I can't remember for sure. So for like 22 years now we've been doing this and it's a, it's been a five or six year cycle. So we're, I believe in the fourth time around, basically covering all the maps that the Buddha used and talking about understanding the mind, understanding the heart. And the way to think of these different maps, um, I think it was Bhikkhu Bodhi, this Western Buddhist monk and uh, really well-known translator. He used this image of the earlier um, aerial photographs when they were mapping out the terrain of a, of a geographic area they'd you know, fly a plane over and they'd have a camera taking lots of photographs. They develop the photographs and they lay them out on a big table. And they're all, all the pictures, the photographs are covering the same basic territory, but you know, a lot of them are overlapping, right? But you just get them placed just right where the boundary of this one lines up with the boundary of that. And <clears throat> pretty much pretty soon you have a map of a big territory called the human heart. And that's really what these teachings are in the course of 45 years. That's a long time. The Buddha was wandering in Northern India and, you know, almost every day, probably he ran into a bunch of folks who had some questions. And so he would teach right from that moment, you know, that's what he had been cultivating this present moment awareness. So his teaching then didn't come, wasn't like on autopilot. He really met the moment, met the person, sensed what might be a useful way to talk about the human heart and about the causes for suffering and the causes for release and share it from there. And so this map that we'll be exploring these next seven weeks, mindfulness of feeling tone, um, is just one of those maps. And for those of you, many of you have been doing the Buddhist studies for a long time and you know that it's, uh, you know, there are a lot of themes that keep coming up over and over again. And certainly feeling tone is one of them. It's one of the most central teachings. And when the Buddha sometimes talks about Nibbana, this unconditional release of the heart, sometimes he taught like the, you know, he didn't talk about it or define it too often, but one of the ways, you know, he talks about it as the cessation of craving that's the more common way we hear about it, or when the latent tendencies to be greedy, to be fearful and aversive, and to be ignorant, when those latent tendencies have been um, uprooted from the heart, that's another way. But 
But another way he talked about freedom or the release of the heart, the unshakable release, is really around feeling tone. Basically, a heart, a mind that isn't confused by the feeling tone of the experience, isn't misunderstanding feeling tone. And you know, when we're having an unpleasant feeling tone, it always feels like somebody's out to get us or I'm getting punished because of this or that. But feeling tone, you know, it's endless. In Buddhist uh, psychology, every moment of sense experience includes a feeling tone. There's no sight, no sound, no touch, no thought, no emotion, no smell, no taste that doesn't have a corresponding feeling tone. Sometimes it's really obvious, this is unpleasant, or this is pleasant, or this is neutral. But a lot of times the feeling tone isn't that obvious. We're not in the habit, we haven't trained the mind, the knowing mind, to notice feeling tone. So um, a lot of you know, we chant the refuges and precepts at the beginning of our Buddhist studies class. I have pasted it there um, in the chat. And for those who are late, maybe I'll paste it again, see if I have it there. Yeah, I do. Good, there it is again. And you know, we talk about the three refuges. It's sort of a traditional thing for a group of people gathering like we're doing to do the practice to I mean, just singing together is a way of coming together. Now, I know it's a little weird because you only hear my voice, but you can sing and imagine everybody else singing or chanting or just connecting with the words. And Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, these three words, taking refuge in each of these three things, it's just Buddhist code, the secret code for our practice. Buddha isn't that person who lived 2,600 years ago, Buddha means wakefulness, being open-hearted, being sensitive and receptive, seeing things as they are. And so Buddha opens to the way it is, that's Dhamma. And when we're opening to the way that it is, when we're intimate with conditions as they are, then it's easier to be Sangha, the third refuge. It's easier to respond, to speak, to be quiet, to act, to refrain from acting in skillful ways. And so we take refuge in being awake to Dhamma the way it is so that we can be Sangha. We can be responding appropriately moment by moment because we're really coming out of that intimacy of Buddha being intimate with Dhamma. So it's, it would be totally fine for you to use three different words or you know, divide it into four things that you wanna keep in mind as you live your life. But part of doing it this traditional way is you know, regardless of where people, you know, Buddhism has moved around the globe over these 2,600 years and wherever it went and all the different lineages, different schools of Buddhism, they do this chant and they do it in the Pali language which is a language spoken around the time of the Buddha. So it's an ancient Indian language, much like Sanskrit. So it's just a way of, as I mentioned a little earlier, connecting with this very wide and deep river of wisdom, human wisdom. In a way, it's our only real inheritance or the inheritance we have that is of real value if we're interested in it. It's like the hard one understandings that humans have realized through their own reflection and passed down generation by generation. And we can join in in that deep and wide river of wisdom and love, I like to call it. Or you could call it human common sense because it doesn't make sense for us humans not to be reflective about the nature of the mind. The most obvious thing about our existence as a human being is that there is a mind. And the most amazing thing is our lack of curiosity about the mind. We're just too busy surviving or finding a partner 
or deciding what kind of car to buy or you know these sort of things that ultimately aren't that important to really set aside some time what is the nature of this thing i call my heart or my mind and how how could getting to know just through observation this heart mind help in terms of the causes for stress and the causes for release how might it be useful? Is it useful to become more clearly aware of this thing we call the mind or heart? So we'll do a guided meditation, but first let's chant the uh, three refuges. You'll see that in the chat, chat if you're unfamiliar. And we do it more slowly than is traditional for these Buddhist studies class, because when we're in person, it's kind of nice to connect with everybody's voice. It's a it's a way of just creating uh, safety. There's actually a lot of psychological uh, research now that you know if you want to bring a group together, do something that everybody does, and just mysteriously everybody starts to feel connected. So that's I think part of how this habit of chanting the refuges at the beginning of the Buddhist studies classes began. We just felt better as a group when we did it. So we'll settle into our sitting posture for the meditation, the guided meditation, a posture that's both upright and relaxed, do the best you can, and let that be good enough for tonight. And whatever posture feels best for you, given everything, and do your best to settle into some degree of stillness in the posture. Initially, you may wish to have the eyes closed in a relaxed way. And as I mentioned earlier, we understand that feeling tone 
arises with sense experience. Each moment of sense contact, sense experience, there will be a feeling tone associated with that experience, a pleasantness, a realization of its unpleasantness or its neutrality, neither pleasant nor unpleasant. So we're gonna move through the six sense gates. And if, for those who don't know, these are the five senses that we're familiar with. The tactile experience, bodily sensation, and hearing, and smelling, and tasting, and seeing. And then the sixth sense gate is mental activity. And we're gonna go through each of these six ways that the mind, the heart, senses or knows the world, the world of experience. There's really no experience outside of these six sense gates. So let's begin by opening to the sense gate of bodily sensation. The world of embodiment that's right here being known already. So we're cultivating a simple interest, a simple attentiveness to this great swirl of bodily sensations coming and going, the totality of this sitting body or whatever posture you might be in. And there may be thoughts, of course, but we're interested in the tactile experience of sitting, the tactile experience of the body And with each sensation, there will be what we call Vedana, this feeling tone. So don't try hard, just be aware of the movement of sensation throughout the body. And every once in a while, one of the sensations will be obviously predominant. In a relaxed way, just as if you were to ask a question, is this pleasant, unpleasant? And a lot of the sensations being known will be neither pleasant nor unpleasant, what we call neutral. And it may be just that it's not clear whether that was a pleasant, the mind understood that to be pleasant or unpleasant. So we just put it in the neutral category but clearly like sharp pain, it will be clearly unpleasant. Or some light vibratory sensation might be obviously pleasant. So we're just sitting intimate with the movement of sensation here, relaxed, the sense of sitting right in the middle of this movement of sensation. And we don't need different bodily sensations than the one that are coming and going now. So however it is, pleasant or unpleasant, generally neutral. Can this be okay that it's this way in the body? Yeah, this will do. And just get curious, like if it's, if it seems obviously unpleasant, certain sensations, and see if you can get clear about that mental 
determination unpleasant. Often we know something's unpleasant, not so much because there's clarity about the feeling tone, but we catch it later when the mind is averse and pushing something away or trying to get rid of something. So the unpleasantness, of course, is related to the aversion, but they're actually two different aspects of the mind. Same thing with greed and holding on to something pleasant. That's different than the pleasant feeling tone. But it's the pleasant feeling tone that often triggers the greed. So they're obviously related. Keeping the movement of sensation in mind. And sometimes we relate to the body as a whole and curious about the feeling tone of this momentary experience of the totality of the body, pleasant, unpleasant, or neither. And sometimes it's a very particular sensation that's come into the forefront like an aching headache, pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. What is it about this sensation being known that makes it clearly unpleasant or clearly pleasant or neutral? We can say that uh, a rising of pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, that understanding in the mind, it happens because of habit. And it's very important to get, learn how to be interested in that experience, very much related to perception the mind recognizing the experience, right in that moment of recognizing the experience, the mind has that determination of pleasantness, unpleasantness, or neither pleasant nor unpleasant. And when you feel like it, you can include the experience of hearing. Let's just keep it to these two sense gates for a while. Aware of the totality of sensation coming and going in the body, the sitting body. And also when you're ready, include the experience of hearing, which might be more neutral depending on your particular room and whether you like the sound of my voice or not. And we 
remember, don't forget to get curious about neutralities. Generally, in any moment, most experience is neutral. And we have a deep habit to ignore what's neutral, neither pleasant nor unpleasant. So for example, you could just take the experience of feeling the shirt touching the skin of the upper body which might be for many of us a pretty neutral experience. And just get interested in that sense contact of touch, feeling the touching of the cloth against the skin, the weight, maybe the temperature, cool or warm whatever might be obvious in this experience. And then noticing the feeling tone. Noticing that it's not understood as either pleasant, nor is it being understood as unpleasant. And you can now also include any experiencing of smell and residual taste in the mouth. Now, again, this may not be very predominant and whatever there is of smell and taste might be pretty neutral depending on your room and whatever lingering taste there might be in your mouth from an earlier meal. Just include it along with the hearing, along with the sensitivity to the bodily sensations. It's a real churning ocean of sense experience through four of the five senses right now, four out of the five bodily senses. And as I mentioned earlier, sometimes you have to trace back, like if you're finding that the mind is not liking something, then trace back the experience. Where is it that something is unpleasant? Go from the like tightening up, which is what we do sometimes when something's unpleasant and get interested in the unpleasantness itself. There's the sense contact and the mental determination unpleasant. And similarly for anything pleasant, clearly pleasant. And finally, 
You don't have to open the eyes because seeing, of course, happens even when the eyes are closed, but you might find it useful to gently open the eyes, just gazing down. So we're not looking around and we're not looking at the screen necessarily. But of course, just looking, even looking toward the floor, you might find the <clears throat> carpet pleasant or unpleasant, the dirt on the floor unpleasant. There'll be different visual experiences and with each visual experience, there will be some kind of feeling tone, pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. So just be curious about that. You don't have to force anything. You might find it helpful for a few minutes <clears throat> in a relaxed way to simply rotate through the five physical senses. So taking 10 or 20 seconds and be aware of seeing and just be interested in whether the experience of seeing is pleasant, unpleasant or neutral. And then spend 10 or 20 seconds being with hearing. And then some time with the tactile experience of bodily sensation. And then with smelling and then with tasting and then back to seeing. So with each of these five physical senses, just curious about anything that's obviously pleasant or unpleasant and also connecting with the neutrality of much of the sense experience from each of these sense gates. So I have some silence for you to explore that.
And then once again, aware of these five physical senses all together, just the swirl or the movement of sense experience, hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, and touching. And of course, there's this other category of experience we call mental activity, thoughts, mental images, imagining, emotion. So just checking on the quality of the thinking mind, the mood, pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. How's the mind? How's the quality of the mind right now? The feeling tone of the mind. And it's not about good or bad or judgment. It's just wanting to know how it is. What's the feeling tone? And of course, if we, if it's not obvious, then, oh, maybe this is neutral because it's neither obviously pleasant, nor is this experience obviously unpleasant. So we don't have to get tight. It's not like we're, we need to know. If we don't know, we call it neutral because it's not obviously pleasant or unpleasant. And one of the things that we'll be discerning as we get better at being interested in the feeling tone of experience, we'll begin to sense how ephemeral it is. It really changes quite quickly. So take a little time and adjust your body. If you've been sitting still, there may be some stiffness, just do what you need. And a big welcome to everyone. And I'm, I know that some of you are new to Buddhist studies, so I'm just going to review some of the expectations for these classes. So uh, first, just in terms of the commitment, the, you know, and it, the Buddhist studies class used to be a relatively small group, but over the years it's grown. And uh, it was easier when we were small, there was a real sense of mutuality and that we're committed to doing this work and the study together. And it was very easy that, you know, if people could be there for the class, they would be there. Now, if they had a family obligation or a work obligation, no problem to have to miss a Monday night. So with this big group, nobody's enforcing this, but we ask that people make a commitment if you can join on Monday night, then join. If something gets in the way and it doesn't make sense for you to be here, no problem. We do record it and it gets put up on the YouTube channel and you can watch it there. And it also gets recorded and the audio gets put up on Dharma Seat. So you have two options to listen to it if you miss a week. 
And that's it's just energetically, I think it makes a difference that we're committing to doing this work. And the other thing about the Buddhist studies class is it's not just a study program. So you might have noticed in the, on the calendar and other places where we post these Buddhist studies classes, we say there's a prerequisite that you've done some retreat practice and you have a commitment to a regular sitting practice, if not daily, most days. Those prerequisites are obviously arbitrary, but what we want is someone, what we don't want is someone taking it just because they're interested in the philosophy or the ideas of Buddhism. We want everybody who's here to be actually putting them into practice, putting some time aside, if not every day, almost every day, where you have a quiet time, you're sitting still, or if you've got a back problem, maybe lying down, but you're in a relatively still posture and you're meditating and you're using some of the themes that we're studying in your meditation practice. You're contemplating these maps in order to learn something you haven't learned about the nature of the mind and experience, right? So that at the end of the seven weeks, in this case, you know more than at the beginning. And the other thing is we, every other week, so week two, week four, week six, we'll have small groups for the last 20 minutes usually. And again, there's a strong encouragement for people to stay for the small groups. Obviously we can't make people stay, but part of being in the group is that you stay for the small groups or you find somewhere at home. Maybe you live with somebody who's a practitioner or you know some of the people in the class and then you have a phone conversation, but that somehow you're having a conversation with the Dharma friend about what you're learning. And that really makes us feel more responsible for doing the work because I'm going to talk to somebody about what I'm seeing or what's frustrating or what's not working or what is working, what I'm learning. So for example, next week, right? Well, I mean, just this most basic level, here's the prompt for what you might share in your small groups, just clear experiences of something being pleasant, unpleasant and neutral. And if you can do it through several of those five physical senses and you get a bonus if you notice pleasant mental states, unpleasant mental states and neutral mental states. Now this is not rocket science. What makes this hard is we just haven't been interested. If we put our mind to it, it all of a sudden begin, becomes very obvious. Oh, this is an unpleasant mind state. This is a very unpleasant mood or this is a pleasant mood. I noticed when my spouse today in the afternoon seemed really happy, I pointed it out. I said, why are you so happy? <laughs> I've been sort of grumpy because I'm, I'm not feeling well. And, uh, and uh, but it's interesting, like when we're, we have a, a nice mood, a pleasant mood, it's interesting how rare it is to have that moment of recognition. Oh, interesting. This mind state is pleasant. Like when's the last time you had that clear recognition? Not that you actually said those words to yourself, but there was that clear recognition. Oh, this is pleasantness being known. Same thing if when you have a, a heavy or an unpleasant mind state or mood or whatever, that is, oh, this is what it feels like. This is the feeling tone of unpleasantness. It's more obvious, probably the place where it will be relatively easy is in terms of bodily sensations, pleasantness and unpleasantness. So just going back to some of the nuts and bolts. So um, at the end of next week, uh, people who can will stay on and um, I or Michelle will divide folks up into small groups randomly and you just have three or four people just to check in. What have you been learning about feeling tone? Where are you noticing it? What happens when you notice feeling tone? This is part of like one of your themes to report back. Um, like when I notice that a sensation in my body, like I have a headache and when I notice 
the you know there's the actual specific sensations like pressure right and then there's that you know it's hard to put words to what a feeling tone is but it's a mental determination like part of the mind perceiving that pressure in the head is that mental recognition that's unpleasant <laughs> right and then very quickly if there's not a lot of wisdom the the body and the mind might tighten up around the unpleasant sense contact of that headache right because generally we want to push away what's unpleasant just like we want to hold on to what is pleasant but they're just we're, we're kind of deconstructing generally the experience you know is happening fast and the attention is pretty superficial so we don't really see any distinction between the hating of the headache and the actual quality of sensation and the perception and the feeling tone of unpleasantness that's just like oh, i don't i just hate my headache you know because the reaction is what gets our attention if we're lucky and all the more subtle nuances of the moment unless you take a buddhist studies course on feeling tone and then you start to get interested and things change so when you really see that this is unpleasant and you open to that as something being known that this is unpleasant that this is unpleasant what happens that's that's the extra credit question for next week in small groups what happens when you keep pleasantness neutrality or unpleasantness in mind with mindfulness so the mind is in balance not judging not reacting just seeing it for what it is what happens and feel free you know just generally um, as a, one of the nuts and bolts uh, people are welcome to send me questions i try to weave them in to the next week's talk so if you have some experiences even if it's not in the form of a question feel free to send it in I, you all have my email address and if you don't that means you didn't register or for some reason we made a mistake and didn't get you in the buddhist studies email the last email that was sent out was this afternoon with the link if you didn't get that email you're not in the buddhist studies email list you can send gabe uh, our office manager an email just send it to info at commongroundmeditation.org at the main email um, and we'll get you on that email list and i'll send an email out tomorrow with a few more reading resources i already sent out a few so if you get that email to gabe soon then you'll get that email tomorrow so you'll have that um, and i'll say something about the theme that you can use uh, prepare for so that you have something to say in your small group next monday night so i think that's enough about the um, nuts and bolts this is a uh, I find it, I don't know, maybe because I've been interested in Buddhism so long, but I find this sutta, this discourse from the Buddha, really beautiful. And somebody approaches the Buddha and addresses the Buddha in verse. At least this is how it got recorded. A tangle within, a tangle without. People are entangled in a tangle. Gotama, which is one of the ways that people refer to the Buddha. Gotama, I ask you this, who can untangle this tangle? Sound familiar? A tangle within, a tangle without. People like me are entangled in a tangle, right? We don't have the Buddha here, but we ask the teachings, we ask ourselves, how do we untangle this tangle? How does that happen? And the Buddha's response, a person established in non-harming, discerning, developing more discernment, developing the mind and heart, a monastic or sincere practitioner, ardent, astute, they can untangle this tangle. 
those whose tendencies for greed, hatred, and delusion have faded away, their outflows ended. Some of you know the word outflows. Uh, it's the translation of asawa, which is an important word in the Buddhist teachings. Asawa gets translated in different ways like taints, cankers, <laughs> outflows, inflows, but it refers to that tendency of our mind towards sense craving, like, oh, if only, and that tendency, like it's an outflow. One of the translations for us was floods, like how our mind gets flooded, overtaken by, if only I have ice cream, if only I could be in bed, in bed with my favorite movie, you know, in bed with my favorite drink and favorite movie and temperature, you know, and friend. <laughs> and on and on like that. That's the flood of sense craving. There's the flood of becoming. If only I could become the person who is X, Y, and Z. Ah. And the flood of ignorance, of self-centeredness, right? These are the floods that overtake the mind. So when these tendencies to greed, hatred, and delusion have faded away, their effluence, their outflows ended, for them, the tangles untangled. And part of that work of untangling the tangle, it's like I said, these overlapping maps, one approach to untangling, each of us untangling the tangle is getting clear about feeling tone. It's the not clearly knowing feeling tone for what it is that keeps the tangle a tangle. Now, you don't have to believe me. It's for each of us. It only helps if each of us checks it out. And if we don't check it out, we miss that opportunity to see what happens when wisdom gets clear about the experience of feeling tone. So out of the great swirl of what it is to have a mind and body, because we're hearing these teachings from the Buddha, a seed is planted in the mind stream. Hey, buddy, get interested in feeling tone, right? So then we take it home, or well, you're already at home, but you know, that idea, oh, maybe there is like in this thing I call, because remember feeling tone is really something happening in the mind. Although what might, the, like I might be aware of the throbbing in my knee, but the determination that's unpleasant, that's something happening in the mind. So we want to keep that in mind. How is the mind, like right with the perception, the recognition of experience, of contact, of sense contact, is a feeling tone. How can we train our mind to keep that in mind, to be interested in feeling tone? Because when we're not aware of feeling tone, what happens? And this is something you can report in your small group next week. Like when there's a pleasant feeling tone and not much wisdom, well, this whole package of psychological, emotional, emotional conditioning just gets set in motion, right? When we're around something really pleasant, we immediately start strategizing to have it and to keep it and to keep other people away from so they don't take it from us, right? That just happens when we're unpleasant. We can't help ourselves. It's not personal. That is the natural thing that happens when there's not a lot of wisdom in the mind and we experience pleasantness. We crave it. And we act on that craving. We become the one who wants it. <laughs> and we imagine ourselves having it forever whatever it might be. And the same thing or, you know, different, but the same pattern with unpleasantness. So Vedana is different than the emotion, which is more than not liking, you know, hatred, greed, delusion. These are sort of more the emotional tone, but it's really close, more closely aligned with the perception 
of the experience. And I mentioned, you know, the Buddha really makes a big deal out of feeling tone. So when the Buddha talked about mindfulness, he conveniently divided up like what you might want to get good at being mindful about the body, feeling tone, the quality of the mind outside of feeling tone, and the causes for delusion and the causes for clear seeing, basically. These, this fourth foundation is called mindfulness of dhammas, but it's really about recognizing the hindrances, the awakening factors that allow the mind to see what it needs to see. So feeling tone is a big part of the Buddhist teachings on mindfulness. When the Buddha describes what it is to be a human being, he often talked about it as the five aggregates, the body, and then he divide the mind into four aspects, uh, perception, feeling tone, mental formations, kind of a catch-all, including intentions and tendencies and consciousness. So, because you could divide the mind, mental activity in any number of ways, but it's, I'm, the point I'm making is that he always highlighted feeling tone. Another really famous map the Buddha uses that we cover in the Buddhist study sequence is dependent co-arising. And feeling tone has a really important place and that teaching as well. So this is not a minor teaching in how the Buddha is inviting us to get to know our experience, or in particular, our mental experience. One of the things to explore this week as you're doing your practice at home, aware of the body, aware of hearing, aware of mental activity, and it gets clear that this experience that's showing up is unpleasant or pleasant or whatever it might be. Well, like I mentioned that sort of extra, that bonus question, if you have some clarity and some continuity of awareness, it's like a way to unhook. I mentioned how when we're not wise, we're not clearly aware, the experience of feeling tone sets in motion a lot of reactivity, you know, just programmed reactivity. And it's very obvious and it's pleasant. It sets in motion liking and grasping and holding. When it's unpleasant, it sets in motion aversion and wanting to get rid of it wanting to turn away from it. And when it's neutral, it sets in motion ignorance. Like, I don't care about you because you're neither pleasant nor unpleasant. So I'm just mm, gonna pretend you're not even happening because you're not pleasant or unpleasant. And just on an animal level, we're strongly conditioned to only be that interested in what's pleasant or unpleasant. And so we can, the interesting thing is is there a way to be aware of feeling tone that interrupts the pattern of going into reactivity? Because clearly we know, right? All of our, or if not all, almost all of our reactive patterns are really stressful. It's interesting, like when something really great is happening to us and we're really excited and really want it to happen, it's stressful. I had this insight as a young kid. I mean, like um, when we were about to go on a vacation, the family like go camping or something when I was a kid, it's like, I couldn't sleep the night before. I was like, and, but I, I had enough space in my mind to realize this is really terrible. Like wanting it to happen was really unpleasant. And I kind of knew that. And, and another place was around Christmas. It's like the excitement on Christmas Eve, you know, we opened the presents on Sunday, on the, on the morning, Christmas morning. And it was just like so unpleasant. And then as I got older, you know, sort of mid elementary age, third or fourth grade, 
it was like, I just knew so clearly that the, what I was going to get wasn't going to line up with my expectations or my desire. So I, it was like suffering. The whole thing turned out to be suffering. And I, I had some like reflective awareness, like this is torturous. You know, why do we go through this every year? Isn't there a better way to do this? <laughs> and so this is the interesting thing. It's like, if I had only had the wherewithal, like when that mental image of Christmas morning and unwrapping the presents arose in my mind, if I would have known, oh, this is a pleasant experience being known. This is what it's like to know pleasantness. Can that be okay? Basically making peace with that awareness of pleasantness or the awareness of unpleasantness or the awareness of neutrality. How does our life change when we've trained our mind to notice feeling tone really discern it for what it actually is. Now that doesn't mean we get it what it is philosophically, but just know at, rather as a, just a natural phenomenon, mental phenomenon. Oh, this is just feeling tone. The image that's sometimes used in the Buddhist tradition is those big bulls or oxen with the ring in the nose and a little child probably one fifteenth of the weight of the animal, but they tie a rope, you know, around the ring and, uh, you know, a five-year-old kid can make the bowl go wherever the kid wants the bowl to go because that big strong animal doesn't want to feel the tug this way or that way of the rope. And, uh, the idea of that image is there's something about our lack of experience, noticing feeling tone and really being there with that mental experience of pleasantness or unpleasantness, seeing it what it is that keeps us trapped and led around by our habits of liking and not liking and ignoring neutral. And and this is, you know, a really apt description of samsara, the endless cycles of suffering, because we haven't taken the time to get interested in this whole reactive cycle. That's basically, you know, we have a mind and body. This is our existential predicament. We're sensitive to the five physical senses. We're also sensitive to mental activity. That's a given for all of us, right? To some degree. I mean, some of us maybe can't see or can't hear, but basically we have bodily sensitivity, sensitivity to the mind. And just because of the way, now each of us differently, but each of us will experience a feeling tone with each sense experience, whether it's through the body or through the mind. And because we're not clearly discerning what that feeling tone is. All of my ancient conditioning around pleasantness and unpleasantness and neutrality just floods the mind, sweeps away the mind. And I'm the one who wants this or wants to get rid of that or is oblivious to all that neutral stuff. And on and on it goes. So we have sense contact, we have feeling, and we have reactivity, basically. That's an ordinary human being. There's a sensitive mind that's sensitive to the five physical senses and sensitive to mental activity. With each sensitivity, with each sense experience, there's a feeling tone that triggers reactivity. Reactivity is just the next thing that we're aware of, <laughs> you know, and that has a feeling tone. And that triggers reactivity and you see how it goes round and round and round and basically never ends. So one of the, uh, this is really from the dependent origination teaching, one of the ways to cut, to interrupt these cycles of stress begetting stress is to train the mind to have enough stability of present moment awareness so that it can 
get interested in feeling tone. It changes things when we can notice that, you know, like being intimate with that experience. One of the questions that I found so helpful in my practice, you know, when I feel stuck, when I feel in one of those loops is, uh, well, what's the underlying feeling here? What's the underlying feeling here? And it's like, maybe initially, like I'll feel it in the body because the body tends to be a more concrete, easily aware, you know, we're more easily aware of something in the body. But then I might notice sort of the attitude in the mind about it. Well, what's the feeling tone of that? So it's not like a one-time question, but it's, it's like a shift in orientation, respecting what's worthy of respect. You know what's worthy of respect? The underlying feeling tone. Because although it doesn't get our attention, it drives so much of our habit energy, right? So, and there's nothing we can do about our habit energy right now because the tendencies of our mind are the tendencies of our mind. I mean, over time, they will change, but right now they're the way that they are. And so we have to sort of um, bring some light into the situation, see something that we're not in the habit of seeing, be aware of something we're not in the habit of being aware of, and that's feeling tone. And that the one of the things that um, I mentioned earlier, you know, don't don't interpret feeling tone as a kind of punishment. We have a the, one of the ways that we keep from investigating feeling tone is we make this wrong interpretation. When something is pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, it just feels so personal. This is from uh, Venerable Analio's book on the Satipatthana, the Buddha's teachings on mindfulness. He writes, just as it would be foolish to contend with the vicissitudes of the weather, one need not contend with the vicissitudes of feelings. Contemplating in this way, one becomes able to establish a growing degree of inner detachment with regard to feelings. A mindful observer of feelings, by the very fact of observation, no longer fully identifies with them and thereby begins to move beyond the conditioning and controlling power of the pleasure pain dichotomy. If we're not aware of feeling tone, then you can almost bet feeling tone is me. I'm feeling this, this is happening to me. This is my feeling, right? But the stability of wisdom awareness creates a whole nother relationship, the possibility of a whole nother relationship. You know, basically the relationship of non-attachment. It's a phenomena being known, but it's relatively subtle. And because things happen quickly and they're subtle, like I mentioned earlier, we tend to be the angry one when it's unpleasant, be the greedy one, when it's pleasant, be the one ignoring when it's neutral. We just immediately become and identify with the reaction. And the other point that Venerable Analio makes in this is, um, yeah, just how feeling tone really feeds our views about things. This is a paragraph, a few, a few paragraphs further into that chapter. The intriguing feature of the Buddha's approach is that his analysis focused mainly on the psychological underpinnings of views rather than their content, right? Because fixing on any view, even a relatively wholesome view, attaching, identifying with views is problematic. So the Buddha was interested in what makes views, opinions, beliefs, what makes them so sticky for our mind, where the mind fixes on them or holds to them. So he writes, 
because of this approach, the Buddha was able to trace the arising of views to craving, which in turn arises dependent on feeling tone. Conversely, by fully understanding the role of feeling as a link between contact and craving, the view forming process itself can be transcended. So it's really understanding feeling tone really helps us get some space around our fixed views. You know, it's like if we have, I just give you an example because, you know, for a lot of us in moments, at least life has been tough, just the social isolation and just the weirdness of COVID and spending so much time on Zoom and the fear and anxiety about getting sick and the loss of loved ones or feeling the pain of those who have been sick and so many other things that are moving these days around racial justice and economic insecurity and so many other things, right? So um, it's very easy for, for us to either have the view, I'm so glad nothing bad is happening to me, you know, like, or this is too much, I can't take this anymore. And so we have a, a generalized pleasant experience, like we're above it all. We've got a nice home, lots of nice entertainments, don't have to go out, don't wanna go out, you know or no, life is really hard. But it's interesting how if we're having a lot of unpleasantness, it really can support a fixed view, life sucks, right? Because interesting, when we really look carefully, we see that that fixed view, you know, I hate my life, or I hate this person, or these people are bad. A lot of time these fixed views is a very inefficient strategy to deal with unpleasant experience or to deal with pleasant experience. Because we don't know how to just see pleasantness, unpleasantness and neutrality for what it is in a funny way, in a weird way, but ways, a way that has so many consequences for more suffering, we use fixed views to manage the exposure to feeling tone. It would be so much better to learn how to be intimate, clearly aware of feeling tone for what it actually is. It's a pleasant experience being known. It's an unpleasant experience being known. This is one of the great benefits for uh, having a regular sitting practice where you sit for an hour or you sit for 30 minutes or whatever amount of time come hell or high water you just sit relaxed relatively upright or whatever posture works for you walking lying sitting standing you put your time in and then it's so you know inevitably there are going to be times when you have a headache you have a knee ache you're too cold you're too hot your body itches, you know, there's a fly in the room, a mosquito in the room, you have indigestion, you have to pee, you know, whatever it might be. Or it's like really pleasant, perfect temperature, nice sounds of birds. And to really see that, oh, th here's the pleasantness but I can just be with the pleasantness. There's a choice of the pleasantness leading to that whole package of wanting, being the one who wants, being the one who will be happy if, you, if I have it, or the unpleasant triggering that whole package of you know, reactivity, of aversion. But there's this option and you can start exploring it this week and you're sitting or in your formal practice. And then um, also throughout the rest of the day, you know, whenever there's a clearly pleasant, unpleasant or neutral experience, realize that this is the thing that unhooks is like this option to be intimate, clearly aware 
clearly comprehending, oh, what's the underlying feeling? Oh, this is the underlying feeling tone here. It's this way. So that verbal question, you know, that I mentioned that I use, it's really just a surrogate for curiosity. So it's in a way, initially, you might need something like that to prompt because it's not the habit for the mind to be interested in feeling tone because it's subtle and because very quickly the reactive pattern has been triggered and that's very seductive to identify with. And then we're kind of off to the races with that. One of the things that I'll uh, put in that email later tomorrow afternoon when I send it out is a section from Bhikkhu Bodhi's book. He's this, uh, a person that I mentioned earlier, uh, Western Buddhist monk and very um, wonderful translator. And he has a wonderful little book that I recommend people uh, really digging into early Buddhist practice get. It's called The Noble Eightfold Path and you can download it online for free. You can also buy the book if you want the paper copy. But he has a chapter or a section in the chapter on mindfulness, on mindfulness of feeling tone. I just want to read a little bit because it's a nice summary. Um, so in that section on mindfulness of feeling tone, Bhikkhu Bodhi writes, feeling acquires special importance as an object of contemplation because it is feeling that usually triggers the latent defilements into activity. The feelings may not be clearly registered that in subtle ways they nourish and sustain the dispositions to unwholesome states. Thus, when a pleasant feeling arises, we fall under the influence of the defilement of greed and cling to it. When a painful feeling occurs, we respond with displeasure, hate, and fear, which are aspects of aversion. When a neutral feeling occurs, we generally do not notice it or let it lull us or let it lull us into a false sense of security, states of mind governed by delusion. From this, it can be seen that each of the roots of the root defilements is conditioned by a particular kind of feeling, greed by pleasant feeling, aversion by painful feeling, delusion by neutral feeling. But the link between feelings and the defilements is not a necessary one. Pleasure does not always have to lead to greed pain to aversion, neutral feeling to delusion. The tie between them can be snapped and one essential means for snapping it is mindfulness. Feeling will stir up a defilement only when it is not noticed, when it is indulged rather than observed. By turning it into an object of observation, mindfulness diffuses the feeling so that it can provoke provoke an unwholesome response. So it cannot provoke an unwholesome response. Then instead of relating to the feeling by way of habit through attachment, repulsion, or apathy, we relate by way of contemplation, using the feeling as a springboard for understanding the nature of experience. And one of the things we'll talk about later is just when we have more practice, more momentum, is just to notice how ephemeral feelings are. It's really interesting. And one experiment you can do, you know, is just have something you really like to eat, like chocolate, you know, whatever it might be. Compose yourself, you know, sitting at your kitchen table or whatever it is. Remind yourself that this is a contemplation that you're doing. And the, it's just a side benefit that you get to eat chocolate or whatever it is you like to eat. And just, you know, even the visual experience will be probably pleasant. The mental idea that I'm going to be eating chocolate might be noticed as pleasant. So you have many opportunities of seeing it, maybe even smelling it, thinking about it, to notice the six sense gates and the pleasantness at each of the six sense gates, right? And you can even do it too with unpleasant, like whether you just pinch yourself or have hot water or food you don't like so much. 
but but really and because it of the composure and the intention the intentionality you can really notice like what happens when there's not much wisdom with the pleasantness or the unpleasantness and what happens when there's more mindfulness and wisdom aware of the underlying feeling of pleasantness and unpleasantness how it's not a problem they did you know they've done these experiments where they uh, i can't remember too much of the details but basically probably college students you know at a coming to some psychology department and they'd have the students they'd put their hands in hot water that you know or no it was cold water that's right it was really cold water water so it wasn't dangerous so much but unpleasant as you know to put your hand in really icy water is, is really unpleasant after a while and they divided the group up randomly and <clears throat> some people were not told anything they just to do it and then they do a survey afterwards like how painful was that and some people were told to um try to distract yourself second group so one group told you know just put your hand in the water other group said yeah when you put your hand in the water distract yourself think about something else and then the third group was put your hand in the water and be aware of what that feels like something like that and you know it's a simple experiment and they found that the people that were uh, invited to feel it didn't report as much pain as the other two groups right so there's something about um that invitation to get interested in the experience we sort of know that anyway because to sign up for a buddhist studies class means you've intuited that there's something about being mindful and what mindfulness reveals are these component parts of our experience and one of the most relevant component parts is this feeling tone as i've been saying Here's a little bit more before we end tonight from Bhikkhu Bodhi's uh, chapter. In the early stages of contemplation of feeling, um, involve attending to the arisen feelings, noting their distinctive qualities, pleasant, painful, neutral. The feeling is noted without identifying with it. Just feeling tone being known. without taking it to be i or mine or something happening to me awareness is kept at the level of bare attention one watches each feeling that arises seeing it merely as a feeling a bare mental event shorn of all subjective references all pointers to an ego the task is simply to note the feeling's quality its tone of pleasure pain or neutrality but as the practice advances as one goes on noting each feeling letting it go and noting the next the focus of attention shifts from the qualities of the feelings to the process of feeling itself the process reveals a ceaseless flux of feelings arising and dissolving succeeding one another without halt within the process there is nothing lasting feeling itself is only a stream of events occasions of feeling flashing into being moment by moment dissolving as soon as they arise thus begins the insight into impermanence which as it evolves overturns three unwholesome roots there is no greed for pleasant feelings no aversion for painful feelings no delusion over neutral feelings all are seen as mere merely fleeting and substanceless events devoid of any true enjoyment or basis for involvement and <clears throat> just from my own experience working with physical pain during the meditation process it's really amazing when there's enough stability of present moment awareness the painful throbbing of the knee or the back is the primary object of awareness and then the mind learns to a uh, highlight the painful feeling tone itself 
simply because actually it's the most relevant thing. In a way, that's what attention wants to go to if it knows, oh yeah, this is what's relevant. And that it's really hard to get from like Bhikkhu Bodhi's very clear description. It really points to like seeing what feeling tone is. It isn't like the superficial perception or understanding of feeling tone is it's something solid. This headache is painful. And it's like, because it's infused with a sense of a me experiencing this substantial painful feeling, it appears to us to be unbearable, deserving of aversion. It would be crazy not to be aversive. But when we take the time to see feeling tone for what it is, it's, it's more like a, a thin veneer of unpleasantness. But as we get to know what unpleasantness is more closely, it's not the problem that we superficially presumed it was. And that's something experiential. Like we actually see that feeling tone like pain, painful experience, isn't a problem. And that's really important to see this because there will be times as a human being when we're gonna be experiencing painful emotions, painful sensations, painful sounds, painful sights, painful tastes. Don't know how we could avoid it as a human being. And if we don't have any understanding about what unpleasant experience actually is, then we will identify with that habit of being somebody, being a person who was oppressed by the unpleasantness. And that will be our reality. We will be the person haunted or hunted by the unpleasantness. That will be the reality we inhabit. So there is a, we can create some other options for ourselves, not just around unpleasantness, but around pleasantness and neutrality as well. It's just that initially for most of us, we're most interested in learning a thing or two about unpleasantness, because that's what scares us, you know, and we know that, you know, what it's like to feel cornered by unpleasantness, whether it's because of a painful breakup or the loss of a dear one, or having a really painful physical sensation, like an illness that we can't just snap our fingers or take medicine and make it go away. So that's enough for tonight. I look forward to seeing everybody next Monday night and I'll send out an email tomorrow afternoon. If you're not in the Buddhist studies email, send us a uh, common ground an email and we'll get you on that list so that you'll get everything have a good week of practice, everyone, and hope to see you next Monday night.